Oh, fantastic. It is so great to be here. Um, I mentioned this yesterday that I do need to change my bio because 1983 makes me really old. But I am. But that's a great advantage for all of you because I've had so much experience, 32 years in this industry, that I can relay a lot of that to you, not only in the keynote, but also in my sessions. So, so welcome to the conference. I want to start this morning, uh, kind of, I, I do a lot of very deep dive technical talks, but I wanted to take the opportunity in this keynote, since I had everybody here, to really talk about architectural modularity. When we talk about architectural modularity, I may use the words microservices, I may use service-based, um, but the point is it really doesn't matter what label we actually place on this, because the real goal and the trend in the industry now is to take very large monolithic applications and basically break those apart into smaller deployment units. Sometimes we call these microservices, sometimes service-based, but we're generally leading towards a level of modularity. We're going to have a lot of talks uh, today. Uh, we have workshops that deal with kind of this move to modularity and microservices. But really, what I want to focus on in this keynote, and we'll dive into some technology aspects, of course, and some details, but I want to really have all of you understand why the hype? Why all the excitement? Why the trend for microservices? You know, about, uh, about 12 years ago, I was in uh, um, service-oriented architecture, and, and that was the latest buzzword back then. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if there was any talk on SOA, it would completely fill a room like this. Well, here today, we're talking about microservices now, and it's the latest buzzword. It's hugely popular. Why? Why are most companies at least investigating, if not moving, to modularity? Well, let's answer that question because there's five main drivers associated with this move to modularity. And it's vitally important to understand these drivers because if your needs don't fit into any of these drivers, then what you're doing is moving your architectures towards distributed modular architectures like microservices without any benefit whatsoever. And there is, as you're going to see in this presentation here, a lot of pain associated with this move. So let's investigate those drivers, because the very first driver in this move to modularity, why companies are so interested in this, is agility. This is the first driver. And I'm going to define agility as the ability to respond quickly to change. In other words, how fast in your applications can you respond to changes in technology, and more importantly, changes in business? the way the business is changing. Well, the problem is this. With monoliths, we have fairly low levels of agility. That rating is very low. Why? Because changes that we make are all combined together. And as a matter of fact, the coordination needed of multiple teams, as a matter of fact, let's think about that, the coordination of multiple teams. Do you realize with monolithic applications, and what I'm talking about are either unstructured or layered architectures, do you realize that it takes the coordination of five teams to make one small field, add one field to a screen? If I have a customer screen and I want to add address line five, just one field to one screen, I need to coordinate five different teams. I need somebody from the user interface team to modify the screen. I need somebody from the back end team to be able to modify all the objects and the rules associated with that particular field. I need somebody from the database team to add it to the schema. I need somebody from a testing team to test my changes. And I need somebody from the release team to release those changes into production. How fast can we respond to changes? Not much. But you know, here's the interesting thing. When we kind of move over to a level of modularity in our architectures, look at that agility, the ability to respond quickly to change. It increases significantly because changes are isolated to independent deployment units that are much more fine-grained, therefore requiring much less coordination. 
Let's take a look now at the next driver, and that is testability. You know, one of the great things that we're going to do with these five drivers is also get a good definition of these particular illities, these characteristics of an architecture. Let's think about testability. Mo uh, monoliths have a fairly low testability rating. Why? You might argue with me and say, oh, no, 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 Mark. It's very good testability because we have lots of automation everywhere in our testing. Isn't it interesting? Let's define testability and why it's so low generally in monoliths. Testability is not necessarily about the ease of testing. I mean, that's one of the aspects of testability. How easy is it to test? And that's usually automation. But think about this. Here's my change right there. In the monoliths, I may have automation testing to automate my unit tests. But here's the interesting thing. What am I actually testing here? And what I'm usually testing is, of course, my change and, oh, other areas of the application. But I'm testing everything? No. Testability is about two things. It's about the ease of testing, hence automation. But it's also about the completeness of testing. Have I guaranteed in this monolith right here, when I make this change, oh, let's see, where is he? There he is. When I make that change right there in that triangle, can I absolutely guarantee 100% that I didn't break anything? No, of course I can't. But look what happens when we move to a level of modularity. Look at that testability rating. It just skyrockets. Ease of testing, full automation. But now, this change right here, what do I test? Because we're modularizing our architectures, I can now do completeness of testing. I can completely test my microservice. I can completely test my macro service. That's why that testability rating is so high. Let's look at the third driver. The third driver is deployability. And this attribute we're going to define as well. Well, there's low levels of deployability and monoliths. Now, deployability is about three things. I'm going to talk about two of them first. The first is about ceremony, because when we have a change, what am I deploying? The entire application. How much ceremony is involved in that? Well, if we have weekly deployments, let's say Friday at 2 AM, why are deployments always in the middle of the night? Boy, that's why I love microservices. Let's think about this. It's Tuesday. So Friday at 2 AM is our deployment. It's now Tuesday. Hmm, we're getting a little concerned because we've only got four days. Now it's Wednesday. Visibly, I'm starting to shake a little bit. I'm starting to get a little nervous. We're running test after test just to make sure. Now it's Thursday. And now I've got beads of sweat coming down because I'm getting so nervous. Now it's the day of deployment, Friday. And basically, I'm just such a nervous wreck that people come to me and say, Mark, do you have a question? No, 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 no. Don't bother me. We have a deployment today. Ceremony. But it's not only about the ceremony. The other aspect of deployability is also risk. What's the risk when I deploy a monolith? What is the chance I can break something? That probability, unfortunately, is pretty high because I've got source code. I've got configuration files. I've got all sorts of artifacts in addition, shared libraries, versions of those shared libraries. Do I have all the right versions for this deployment? That's a lot of risk. Now watch what happens when we move to a level of modularity in our architectures. Look at that deployability. It significantly increases. Now let's go through the ceremony. What's the ceremony when we have a level of modularity of independent deployment units? And let's use the example of microservices, for example. The ceremony, hmm, maybe a couple of hours. What is the ceremony? Well, make sure, let me run the test. Green light, green light, green light, push into prod. Sometimes it's just a matter of running a script, hitting enter, wait, 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 hot deploy. That's the ceremony. But let's take a look at the other things. What is my risk? My risk, because this is a single deployment unit, is fairly small. Because what is the probability that I'm going to impact the entire application context? Now, that's what I'm at risk of. Now, there's a third element I mentioned about deployability. And that 
is the frequency of deployment. How many times do you deploy? Hmm. Sometimes the answers are once a week, once a month. I love the answer once a quarter. You know, once a quarter you're releasing software. Do you know that's why it never works? Four times a year you get to practice releasing software. It will never, ever work. But the frequency of deployment, I could deploy every single day with less risk and lower ceremony. That's deployability. Ceremony, risk, and the last one, frequency. Let's move on to the fourth driver of modularity, and that is of scalability. Now with monoliths, we have fairly low levels of scalability. Oh yes, yes, we can scale out a monolith. Here we go, you ready? There we go. I've just scaled it on one server. Well, can you scale it again? Yes. Oh, there we go. Can you scale it again? No, please, I'm getting tired. And we have to scale out the whole thing, but look, at when we move to modularity, look at this level of scalability. It goes high because we have function level scalability. I can scale out any portion that needs to be scaled. This note only is efficient, but it also saves a lot of money in cost. It becomes feasible to finally scale our applications. There is one more driver, the fifth driver, and that is that of availability. Now, I'm going to spin availability into a different thing. Usually, architecturally, we think of availability in terms of nines of architecture, three nines, for example, 9.9 or 99.9%. .9%. Availability is also about fault tolerance. So let's take a look at the ratings on monoliths. Fairly low levels of ability, uh, of ability, of availability. Why? Oh boy, if we have a crash in our monolith, what comes down? The entire monolith. And then that happens, all operations are done for, for minutes before we recover. But let's move to a level of modularity and look at that rating for fault tolerance availability it goes really high because that same exact failure is isolated to a single deployment unit, therefore only impacting that portion. In other words, creating fault-tolerant applications is getting to a level of modularity in our architectures. Isn't it interesting, though, when we take a look at these five drivers, agility, testability, deployability, scalability, and availability, these are the reasons why all companies are so excited about modularity, about microservices. But let's take a little look at business and technology. Here's an article from The Economist, a magazine I read. And this article from last year is about the creative speed, the rate of change in business. And it says right here, this is a quote from it, executives worry that they won't keep up with this quickening world. Business is moving so rapidly. As a matter of fact, if you think about all these monolithic applications that have served us well for decades and decades, why the big change? The big change, business has always been changing, but not as rapidly as it is today. It is very, very hard to compete. As a matter of fact, this article here from Forbes says this, rapid technology change is the biggest threat to global business. Is technology changing every day? More so than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. These monolithic architectures, which are simple and fairly reliable and fairly performant, served us well when there wasn't the rate of change we have today. As a matter of fact, this article from Appian says this, agility essential as businesses face rapid pace of change. This was from last year as well. And now we know what agility means. How fast can we respond to changes? Let's do, um, do a little experiment here. In today's world, most businesses are having a tough time keeping up. Most businesses are failing because they cannot respond quick enough to changes in business, in the industry, in the economy, and also technology. Let's take a moment, just a couple of minutes, as a matter of fact, less than a minute, and talk about competitive advantage. 
Now, I'm going to set the stage here to say, um, so the folks in the middle here can actually take a break because, no, I like this. We're going to do three companies. Okay, here's company A. This is us, by the way. So we're all going to be one company. Okay. This is company B right here. And this is company C. Now, we all happen to be streaming companies. We stream videos and movies and stuff like that. Okay. A change comes on in the industry. Hmm. You know, we've noticed that there's this, been this question, kind of buzz around the industry, about downloading movies and shows so I can watch them offline. Hmm. Well, you came up with this idea for our company, but so did you and company B. And as a matter of fact, about at the same time, Venkat over here, the great Venkat, came up with the idea for your company. Uh-oh, now I have to compete against Venkat. Okay. Let's think about this. Competitive advantage. The faster that we, as a company here, can respond quicker to the change to make downloaded movies and TV shows available, that's competitive advantage. As a matter of fact, the first of you three companies that does that gets my business. The other ones don't. Okay. So this is a good example of competitive advantage. So what does it take for us to do this before these guys over here? Agility. Listen, at high levels of agility, the ability to respond quickly to change. Here's a change that you identified, you identified, and Venkat identified about at the same time. We all three got it. But how fast can we respond to that business change? Agility. Now, we want to win. What is that? Time to market. The faster we can get this out, the better. Now, agility. We can make changes very quick to our applications to allow downloaded movies and stream, you know, so, so I can stream offline. However, we have a four-week testing cycle, and we have monthly deployments. We will fail. And you guys will win. So we need time to market. What's that? High levels of testability. The ease of and also the completeness of testing. Deployability, we've already defined that. Not only the ceremony, but also the low risk. We don't want to get this out tomorrow and all of a sudden everything breaks. We'll lose customers. High levels of testability and deployability. And if we could do this, we will get the business, which means our systems need to scale. So would all of you concur and agree that the ingredients to competitive advantage in businesses today to stay afloat are high levels of agility, testability, deployability, and finally, scalability? I think that's a good argument. We all agree? Perfect. Let's take a look at a graph here. I'm going to show you three architecture styles. We're going to, take, we're going to go over these in a little bit, but um, monoliths, of course, we don't need to go over monoliths. We all know about monoliths. In the middle, we have service-based architecture, which I'm going to show you in a little while, and also, finally, microservices, which I'll also describe. What I've got here, and I know it's hard to see down here, so I'm going to describe them. From left to right, is agility, deployment, testability, performance, scalability, simplicity, and overall reliability. And I've got these ratings. Now I'm going to move this slider bar that you see under, uh, what is it called, monoliths. Uh, I'm going to move that over. But let's take a look where the slider bar is. You know, monoliths, relative to the other architecture styles we're going to investigate in this keynote, have fairly high levels of performance. They're not distributed. So we may have performance issues, but as a pattern of architecture, they're fairly performant. As a matter of fact, because they're not distributed, they're fairly reliable. I mean, once we make a user request, we bounce around and then give the answer. There's no restful calls. And finally, they're very simple, which translates to cost. They're really cheap. Great. Hmm. But what aren't they good at? Look at these low ratings here. Development, or agility, deployment, testability, scalability. I just went through that whole thing that monoliths do not support these. But wait a minute. This is interesting. Didn't we all agree that the ingredients to competitive advantage in today's market are high levels of agility, testability, scalability, and deployability? Look at these ratings right here. They're the lowest possible. Well, I maintain this. If this is what your architecture styles look like, monoliths, then how can you expect to compete in this market today? And the answer is you can't and you won't. We can't keep up. That is the reason for the hype. 
it's important to at least understand why we're doing things. Now, watch this. I'm going to move this slider bar over to a level of modularity called service-based architecture, which I'm going to show you next. Well, two next. <laughs> now watch what happens. Watch closely to the graph. Are you ready? Set, go. Let's move this over. Ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. There it goes. OK. You ready? Now watch the graph. Look what happens. As we move to a level of modularity, service-based architecture, look what we did. We increased the level of agility, deployment, testability, and scalability. Those ingredients to competitive advantage, the way to stay afloat today, not only in business change, but also technology change. But we did pay a price, didn't we? Yeah, performance is lower because we're making restful calls into these separately deployed units. And because of that, simplicity, yeah, we have contracts, timeouts, restful calls, these kind of things. And because of that, the reliability is a little low. But that's not too bad of a price to pay. Would you agree? Yeah. Let's move the slider bar all the way over to microservices. Are you ready, set, go? Now, watch the graph. As we start to move towards microservices, look what we maximize. We actually maximize agility deployment, testability, and scalability. As a matter of fact, this is the only architecture style in existence right now that truly maximizes all four of these characteristics, including, by the way, availability. But that's competitive advantage. That's why so many companies are fascinated and so interested in microservices. So the question for all of you that you need to answer is this. Do we need, as a company, this level of competitive advantage, that high of a level of agility? Because look at what we price we paid. We paid a dear price this time, didn't we? Performance will suffer in microservices. Every single connection point, every single communication point is remote, which means we are going to have so much latency. Now, there are technical ways, which we'll see, about how to kind of address that level of, of performance. But we pay a price on performance. Reliability, because we have so many moving parts that most of the time we need to communicate with. If one of those go down, all of a sudden other things start going down because of dependencies. And simplicity, I have been in this industry for 32 years, 22 of those as a software architect. And the past five, pretty much devoted my entire career to microservices. And I can tell you firsthand, after 32 years in this industry, this is the hardest architecture style I've ever encountered. I have done space-based architecture, which was the prior most hardest piece. Microservices has won in terms of being the most difficult architecture style to implement and to control. OK, so the question you need to answer is this. Do we need this level of agility, or is this good enough and service-based? Or is it right about, here we go, there. Stop, stop. I don't have a stop button. OK, that's, that's the game we're playing in terms of granularity, in terms of architecture, in terms of where we need to be. OK, so let's actually take a little tour now of services. So if we take a tour of modularity and start moving towards modularity, let's actually take a look at these architecture styles now. Now that we have the reason, the reason why companies are so interested, now we can actually start analyzing architecture. Well, let's take a look at modularity. So this is an article by Martin Fowler. As a matter of fact, the date here, I believe, is October 2014. It's an article about sacrificial architecture. You want to see this. I know the, the link looks long, but if you just Google Martin Fowler sacrificial architecture, you'll come to this article here. Very powerful article written four years ago, well, three and a half years ago, about sacrificial architecture. In other words, the ability in this ever-changing world to sacrifice portions of our applications. Can you imagine a monolith and basically just hitting the delete key on every single piece of software code and starting over? No, of course not. But with mergers, acquisitions, changes in technology, changes in versions, new platforms coming out, new frameworks coming out, 
new business needs coming out all the time. Sacrificial architecture is kind of this idea that we can sacrifice portions of our architecture without being too disruptive. And let's explore sacrificial architecture in the spirit of modularity. When we take a look at modular architectures, here's an interesting thing. We don't necessarily have to go to distributed architecture. There are really two paths when we start to move towards this level of modularity, sacrificial architecture. The first path are modular monoliths. The second path are distributed applications. Within the monolithic, we actually have three architecture patterns to choose from to create modular monolithic applications. This gives us a slight level of increase in all those ingredients of competitive advantage. Deployability, agility, testability, scale it, well, not scalability, at least three out of the four, okay. Pipeline architecture, microkernel, modular monoliths. Now on the other side of the coin, though, we have the distributed architectures, service-based architecture, microservices, and event-driven architecture. These are all of our choices that we have. You know, a lot of companies don't have the infrastructure, the ability, the staff, or the money to be able to move into the world of distributed architectures. This is a whole different world. As a matter of fact, it's so different. Over here, at the very, very, very end of the steps here, is monolithic. Way at the other end, over on these steps here, is distributed. That's how far away they are. Distributed architectures introduce a host of issues. As a matter of fact, uh, the eight fallacies of distributed computing by Peter Deutsch all apply to distributed architectures, as well as transactionality, distributed logging, maintaining contracts and those versions of contracts. It becomes very, very complex. But given the time we have, I'd like to focus on these two architecture styles for right now, and that is microservices and service-based. And what I want to do is instead of kind of say this is what they are, I want to actually show you the power of these two architecture styles in relation to sacrificial architecture. What does that really mean? I'm going to demonstrate it for you. Are you ready? Let's take a look at microservices first. And when we have microservices, basically we have client requests from a user interface, maybe some of other external system, all coming into an API layer, which may just be a proxy or it could be a gateway, that fronts small, fine-grained, independently deployed services. As a matter of fact, I'll define a microservice as a single purpose, fine-grained service that does one thing really, really well, and it has to own its own data. That's microservices in a nutshell. Good, any questions? Of course, yes, how do you do it? <laughs> no, but let's take a look at microservices from a modularity standpoint. How powerful is this architecture style in relation to what we just talked about in terms of all those competitive advantage attributes, all those drivers of modularity? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say that we have, and here's an example of microservices, a, a benefits application. Now, in, in the US, and especially in, in most countries, the government or the state will offer its residents benefits. And these could be childcare, emergency cash, health benefits, dental benefits, so on and so forth. These are all funded, at least in the United States, these are all funded through budgets. And so if we want to have another program, these are called programs of assistance to help people, the state funds that program through a budget. And so how fast can we respond? If we have a monolith and the state allocates 1 million rupees, is that a lot? I think that's a lot. It sounds like a lot. A million rupees? No. Let's say 10 million rupees. That's a lot. Right? Is that a lot, Risha? No, still not a lot. Uh, 100 million rupees. 100 million, is that a lot? A billion rupees. Now we're talking a lot of money. Okay, a billion rupees um, for a healthy kids program at schools so that you can apply to this benefit if you can't afford lunches, that the, 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 the state, the government, will uh, pay these for you. That is now budgeted with one million rupees. How fast can we respond? There is money available, yet it takes us four months to code and test and deploy that functionality because it's in one big monolith. Four months people are waiting for a benefit that the money's there. Well, watch this. All we have to do is drop in a microservice. And that microservice is for the Healthy Kids program. 
That microservice contains all of the rules and the data for healthy kids. I can respond so quickly that when that budget gets approved, literally within a week, we are able to actually do that benefit. Now, we have other benefits. Foster kids that's funded, let's say, for a foster kid program for, let's say, nine months or whatever. And so we have that. Now, what happens after six months? After six months, how agile can we be that all of a sudden there's no more money in that budget for healthy kids? You know what we get to do? Sacrifice our architecture. We just simply remove that microservice. What else have I done to anything else? Nothing. I haven't impacted anything. As a matter of fact, if we have changes to rules associated with a particular microservice, it's utility. My heat's about to be turned off. I've lost my job. I have three kids at home. Please help. It's cold. Well, the AC. <laughs> Here you don't have to worry about heat, I guess, do you? Let's say the air conditioner is about to be turned off and it's too hot. Um, the government will give you money for this. And so the point is, but the rules change. Well, look at this. I can change those rules pretty instantly without impacting everything else. As a matter of fact, let's take a, another example of a data lake or a data warehouse. How fast can you respond to user requests for new reports in a data lake? or a data warehouse, using microservices quite quickly. Now you might think, well, hold on, Mark. There's this thing called a bounded context, and you're talking to one large data lake with microservices, or a data warehouse? Absolutely. Do these schemas change? All the time, but they're usually appended. We never break a schema in a data lake. We never break a schema in a large reporting database. It's too disruptive. What a great example for microservices. Think about this. We all of a sudden get new reports. We'll take this. There's another microservice. We simply, I'll call this drop-in functionality because we can start dropping in requests, dropping in reports without impacting anything else. These are self-contained, separately deployed units of software. A service, microservices. Now, if we want those reports and we don't need any reports, we simply just start removing those reports and we're not impacting anything else in our ecosystem. Isn't it interesting? This is a great demonstration of the fact that we can bend the rules of microservices in that bounded context and still leverage this kind of modularity to be able to say, within a day, I can deliver you that report. Within two days, within a week, not a month. Okay, wonderful. So let's take a look at even a more powerful sacrificial architecture, and that is service-based architecture. This is a hybrid of microservices. Well, we have client requests that are actually coming into a user interface layer, not an API. This is like an application, a website, or a large back-end application that has a front-end user interface. Now, that user interface may be split up, but the point is user requests coming to that interface going to separately deployed units of software. But these are macro services. These are portions of an application. These are not fine-grained. These are coarse-grained, separately deployed units of software, all sharing the same database. That is service-based architecture. Now, if we analyze this, let me show you an example here of sacrificial architecture. As systems grow, this is, a, this is an electronics recycling application, an actual, an actual project, an actual application, an actual company. This started out as a Ruby on Rails application. Just get it out the door. This is a new venture. We're going to try to recycle old electronics. Let's try it out. So we quickly created a Ruby on Rails app. And guess what? The company was hugely successful. And so we started to grow and grow. Pretty soon we realized with this small Ruby on Rails website, we couldn't really integrate to other systems. As the company started growing, we couldn't distribute it. So we converted it over to Java as a monolith. And that got us going for about another two or three years until suddenly the functionality was growing so much that we couldn't be agile enough. New products, new features, new rules. So this is service-based architecture. Notice that the user interface here, I've got kiosks in the mall or at the stores. I've got a public user interface here. I've got a receiving where I receive your electronic, and then I actually have a recycling API. All of these are services. This is quoting to let you know, um, I'll give you some money for your old iPhone or your old Galaxy or your old camera. Uh, 
There's uh, item status. You can actually go onto the website and check to see if I've received your phone and if I've made the payment yet. And then receiving has two things right here. A receiving service, very coarse-grained, and an assessment service. And then correspondingly over here, we've got recycling, accounting, and reporting. All kind of the admin portions, the back end piece. All separately deployed units of software. Very coarse-grained, thousands of classes here. Now I want to pick on one aspect of this architecture. As we start growing and growing, we got to this level right here. You know where most of our change is? Most of our change is right here in assessment. Because as we get new products, this service right here with its corresponding data had all of the rules associated with how to inspect an item to determine its quality if we can resell it or destroy it. That was the decision process. And how much money we can give you. All those rules, think how fast that changes. It basically every day almost that changes, at least once a week, if not 10 times a week. <sighs> Agility, testability, deployability. Every time I add a new product that comes out that we're recycling, I have to go into this service right here, which is kind of a macro service, and I now have to change code. Coordination, yeah, it's a pretty big service. What should I test? The entire assessment service. There's thousands and thousands of electronic products in there. I have to deploy that whole unit. Although it's just a macro service, it still contains too much. Watch this. Because I've separated this out, modularity, I can sacrifice that entire application, this entire assessment, and watch this. I can actually now convert it to microservices. Only that portion to where each service represents a single product and its corresponding data for rules associated with how to assess that product. What else did I change in my architecture? Absolutely nothing. Now, let's look at the far right-hand side. You see this reporting service? Did I describe? It started out as a Ruby on Rails application. Did we need reporting? Sure. It was just a bunch of Ruby code. And then we moved to Java. We started writing Java code. Well, now the company's about, uh, now about 10 years old, little, yeah, about 10, 12 years old. And the reporting needs, because this is such a large company now, far outweigh all this custom thing. It's like, why are we doing custom reporting? Well, it kind of organically grew. You know, it started out with Ruby, we converted it. Well, now we can actually watch this. Sacrifice that entire service. Remove it from production and replace it with a product like Microsoft Dynamics. We could do the same thing, as a matter of fact, with accounting. All of our accounting functionality, which we were. As a matter of fact, let me back up for a minute here. There we go. There's our reporting. Accounting is all custom code. Well, that's crazy. We can sacrifice all the accounting logic and now use Sage, for example, in Act, which is a cloud-based accounting system. Why are we maintaining our own code for accounting? Well, it made sense when the company was young, but not now. Do you see how powerful these modular architectures are? They're very, very powerful. All right, so let's take a look at a um, very interesting aspect of change. Um, what I'm going to do now is actually show you the move towards modularity. Okay, and this is where I actually now get really excited. Okay, I haven't been excited yet. Now I'm really going to get excited. Okay. Isn't it interesting? The move to modularity, and we're actually going to see these steps in excruciating detail tomorrow in my microservices architecture and design. But let me just show you a little hint of that. Because we have our monoliths right here. Our modular, or not even modular, our monolithic end tiered or unstructured. And what we want to do is move towards this level of modularity over to microservices. Yes, almost every company is considering this and or doing this, and now we know why. We have a context. It's nice to know a context as opposed to saying, why are you moving to microservices? Because <sighs> it looks great on my resume. Yes, <laughs> RDD, Resume Driven Development. Yes, and sometimes, unfortunately, that is the exact reason why we are moving to microservices. All right, but now we know we have five drivers. And isn't it interesting? If you cannot qualify 
that you need high levels of agility, that you need high levels of testability, of deployability, time to market, scalability, or fault tolerance, then this is a waste of time. It's important to know the drivers. But you know what this move from a monolith to microservices is exactly like a steeplechase. Now, a steeplechase is where you race horses really, really fast, and you jump over these eight-foot hedges or logs. All right. Now, I know this is India, so I'm very curious about this question. How many of you have ridden a horse before? All right, quite a few. OK, how many of you have done a steeplechase? When you move to microservices, you will be doing a steeplechase. And if you've never ridden a horse before, or if you've never done a steeplechase, I can promise you, you will fall off that horse. And you will get hurt very badly. This right here is exactly an image of the pain that most teams are experiencing right now today, trying to move to this most complex architecture style. It is a steeplechase. I feel really bad for this horse right there. Look at that note. Ooh, that's going to hurt. Let me ask you a question, though. This is a lot of pain. And this will happen to you. It will. Doesn't it make sense, if we're going to be doing a steeplechase, to actually learn how to ride a horse first? Of course. And once we've learned how to ride a horse and we've mastered that, got a long way to go, then we learn how to ride a horse fast, really, really fast. And then, and only then, once we've mastered learning how to ride a horse fast, then we embark on that steeplechase. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? How do we apply that to architecture? Let's do it. What does it mean to learn how to ride a horse fast? Learning how to ride a horse fast with very little pain is actually taking your monolith and moving to service-based architecture. As we saw, this is a level of modularity where we don't have to break up the user interface, but usually we do and do a couple of parts. But we split apart our application into multiple deployment units, chunks, portions of the application, customer, shipping, order management, chunks of what our application does, all sharing the same database. You know what? This right here, this architecture style, does not require DevOps. It uses the same exact environment you have now. As a matter of fact, it doesn't require organizational change, but microservices does. So learning how to ride a horse, let's talk about DevOps first. Do I need DevOps for this? No. These are ear files or assemblies. I've only got six to seven, maybe upwards to 10 of these. Can I do 10 manual deployments, six manual deployments in my current environment? Of course. Oh, it's going to be a little bit more time, but of course I can. And so now, now take a look at this. We can say, let's try Docker on this one to the far right. Now, the, let's say this is in WebSphere. There's a Docker container for Liberty. Um, let's put our code in there and try that out. And as a matter of fact, we can manually do this. Docker, run, payment. And there's our payment system. Our payment service starts up. Hey, that's pretty neat. We're using Docker. Let's actually try that with this service, and then this service, and so we start moving on. You know, we've got a simple service locator pattern right here in our user interface that's actually just going straight to these. Let's try Zookeeper. Nah, that didn't work too well. Let's try Console to be able to register a service and then find that service again. That worked. Do you see what we're doing? What we're doing is actually developing a DevOps infrastructure over time when it's not required. That's really powerful. Now, more importantly, is the need for organizational change in microservices. Conway's law, which Melvin Conway in 1973, stated that companies will develop software that matches their organization's communication and organizational structure. It's called Conway's law. And if you think about it, he is exactly right. How do we develop software? We have layers, don't we, in the hierarchy. We have, well, not a hierarchy. Well, we do still have a hierarchy, but layers. We have UI developers, don't we? And then we have back-end developers. And then we have database folks. And we're an expertise in every rules developers. And we're an expertise in each one of these layers. <sighs> Microservices require something called the inverse Conway maneuver. The inverse Conway maneuver says this. We're going to take, oh, by the way, and it answers this question or asks this question. 
can the way we develop software influence the organization's communication and organizational structure? I've been doing this for five years, and I've seen a lot of hope. I've seen a lot of success. What we're doing is this. Here's the layers. Presentation, business, database. And we're rotating them 90 degrees so that all these rows become columns. All you folks are presentation, Angular experts, over here, or React. Yeah, let's use React. Um, over here in the middle are all the back-end developers, and way in the back up top there are all of the database folks. What we're doing is this. We're calling these cross-functional teams with specialization. We're gonna carve teams straight up the line here so that on any given team, I've got a UI expert, I've got a back-end expert, and I've got a database expert. I also have a tester, and I also have a release engineer that's virtually assigned to that team. That's how we get the agility. It's required. Now, let me ask you a question. What's your relationship with your testers? Who? Your testers. Oh, yeah, the testers. Yeah, those people. You know, here's an interesting question. What do testers do? And by the way, before I answer that question, do you realize that there will always and forever be an adversarial relationship between testers and developers? Developers do not like testers, and testers get really irritated with us. Why? What do testers do? Well, they test your code. No, they don't. Testers basically find fault with everything you do. It's almost like a bad marriage. You know, why can't you say something nice about me for once? Yes, that's why it's always adversarial. Now, what we have with here, learning, by the way, we're still learning how to ride a horse. We're going to do a steeplechase in a bit, but we're still learning how to ride a horse. What we have here, I told you I get excited about this. What we have here is learning how to ride a horse. We do not need organizational change. We can still use a communication model. Let me explain the communication model between testers and developers. Here's what happens. Tester over here is testing your code. No, they're finding fault with you. And what do they do? They advertise it to the world through a JIRA ticket. OK. <laughs> so here are you, way over here. You're the developer now. What do you do? You get that advertisement that you're a horrible person. And what do you do? You see the problem. What's the first thing that you need to do? You need to try to replicate the problem. Let me ask you a question. How many thousands of hours in your career so far have you spent trying to replicate a bug or a user problem? Thousands and thousands for me. Why? We have different environments. We have different data. We have different ways of approaching the problem. We have different pathways through the screen. But you know what the problem is? It takes a long time, and we usually don't have that time. So you know what we do? Oh, we know the line of code that's the problem, but I can't prove it. And so I change the code. Yep, did you, yeah, did you demonstrate that problem? Oh, yeah. So we change the code, goes back over to the tester who says, oh, you're a horrible person. They test it, and of course it doesn't work. And so it gets bounced back to you. This is why this adversarial thing happens, but this is a communication model. Now, that works OK here. But it will never, ever, ever work in microservices. To get from here to microservices, that steeplechase, requires to move from this communication model to a collaboration model. The collaboration model has testers that are assigned to each team. They are part of our virtual team. They attend our stand-ups. They are involved in all the functionality of what we are doing. We talk to them all the time. Now watch this. Tester doesn't find fault with you now because we're collaborating. And they say, hey, Mark, you got a second? And I say, um, sure, just a minute. Um, yeah, what's up? Hey, look at this problem. Every time I put ampersand space spaced in the name field, it blows up. And we're on the same team. What's my response as a developer? Well, no one would ever do that. You know, we're developers. We think logically. This is zeros and ones. No one would ever put an ampersand space space in a name field. Why are you doing that? You know, this is the difference between developers and testers. Testers know that people do this. So the point is we have a little argument, and it's like, OK, 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 OK. Uh, wait a minute. I got an idea. OK, um, refresh. Try it again. Hey, it's all fixed. Good. We do a couple high fives. We write a JIR ticket to celebrate our success. That's collaboration. That takes about six months for us in my current project. That took us six months to get to. 
cross-functional teams of specialization and breaking down both those physical and virtual barriers between developers and testers. Now, I know I only have 15 minutes, so I'm not even going to talk about release engineers. But we do that, and we learn to ride a horse. Now, let's learn how to ride a horse really fast and move to microservices. But I have a question for you. What do you want to do first? Because we're going to take each of these macro services, and now we're going to learn how to ride a horse fast and move these to microservices. But we have an admin service right here, an admin service. It's a separately deployed service. Now, there are 40 operations, which would translate to 40 services. These are things like you know, entering name value pairs, maintaining agency codes, claim codes, um, adding users, removing a user, giving a user authority. And as a matter of fact, Venkat is the only single user there. He's in there about once, oh, once a day, maybe. OK. That's option one. Option two, here's our customer-facing portion of the application. 200 operations, which is going to translate to 200 services. There's 2,000 concurrent users hitting our website. This is our bread and butter. This is the most important piece of our application. It has to stay up. It changes all the time. There's a lot of code volatility. In other words, the frequency of change. <sighs> Lots of risk. Let me ask all of you, what do you want to tackle first? Which one do you want to do first? Customer. Oh, you guys are that bring the pain forward thing, aren't you? Oh, dear. Um, who's on the admin team with me? Touche. There you go. Who's on the customer team with the folks over here? Oh, you guys are good. Because 98%, you guys are very good, because 98% of all teams will choose admin. It's a very good choice. Why? Lower risk, isn't it? What if I, what if I mess up? Who have I impacted? Van Cat. One user. And he's only in there once every couple of days. Only 40 services. Fairly simple. So why wouldn't we experiment and learn with admin? Why jump into the most complex area of our application? Doesn't it make sense to be over here? It certainly does. OK, so let me ask the question then. Who wants to be on my team with admin? Oh, now no one does. <laughs> Uh-oh. Something went wrong. Um, I love you guys. You are risk takers. I love it. And as a matter of fact, you know what the curious thing is? All of you are exactly right. Customer is exactly the right choice. 98% of the teams will choose admin for two reasons. One, low risk and learnability. One benefit, well, two benefits, two one-time benefits for a lifetime of pain and misery supporting 40 services that aren't needed. In other words, most companies and most teams will move from a monolith right here over to microservices and do that steeplechase without getting to this point of learning how to ride a horse and not ever be able to answer this question. Once we get here, learning how to ride a horse, service-based architecture, now we have the opportunity to say, OK, everybody, let's start on admin. One simple word, why? Well, uh, agility, the ability to respond quickly to change. Hey, when was the last time admin changed? Click, click, click. About six months ago, pretty minor change. Oh, uh, testability and deployability. Um, oh, wait, there's no code volatility here. Um, oh, scalability, ha, 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 gotcha. Oh, yeah, it's just Venkat. Oh, fault tolerance, remember that one? Wait a minute, we already have fault tolerance right here. Because if I make a mistake here in admin, I'm not impacting our customer area. I've already got those things. In other words, here's the bottom line. Not every portion of an application has to be microservices. Modular, yes. Microservices, no. Customer is exactly the right choice. So touche for all of you. This is fantastic. High levels of agility, yeah, this code changes every day. Deployment, testability, which point to time to market. Oh, yes, we want to get those features out to our customers and those bug fixes as soon as possible. Scalability, this is what needs to scale. Fault tolerance, yes, this is, this is the most important area. All five are right here. So let's learn how to ride a horse fast. Are you ready? One, two, three. 
Now we're going to learn how to ride a horse fast. And look what we've done. We moved only those portions that needed to be to microservices. But did you notice something? I broke apart the functionality into 200 services. But what didn't I do yet? The data. The data, as we found yesterday when I gave my talk, is the steeplechase. This is learning how to ride a horse fast. Now, once we've mastered this, then and only then do we actually embark on that steeplechase and migrate the data. That is truly, truly the hard part of this migration. Isn't it interesting? This is a great path. All right, fantastic. So hopefully this kind of short keynote uh, gave you some insights into, into some of the complexities, but also the reasons why. And that was really what I'm trying to drive. Why are we doing what we're doing? Um, I've created a website uh, back in January uh, called developer2architect.com. And this is kind of my give back. Um, it's a website devoted to this journey from developer to architect. I thought it would be good to show this. I've been at the conference for five days now. Uh, well, four days. <laughs> and, um, and this is the first time I'm showing this because this is the architecture conference. And, and this journey from developer to architect is, is riddled with all sorts of, of pitfalls and challenges and fire-breathing dragons, everything you can think of. And so what I've done here is I've provided a lot of resources, articles, books, uh, videos, and specifically, if you go to this developer to architect, go into lessons, I, every Monday I do free architecture lessons. It's a video, basically, of a five to 10 minute lesson about architecture. And so I'd encourage all of you to watch those videos. There's uh, 15 of them out there now, because um, it's been 15 weeks. And as a matter of fact, I call it Software Architecture Monday. Uh, it's kind of hokey, but it's kind of every Monday. <laughs> Anyways, it, it's something that, that I, I do is give back, um, but it's also good for all sorts of resources. Um, the other thing, Neil Ford and I have recorded a lot of videos in O'Reilly uh, on Safari Online, uh, Software Architecture Fundamentals. I've done a lot of messaging videos. Uh, Neil's done a lot of videos on his own about and, um, evolutionary architecture, but uh, there's a lot of great information here. So um, anyways, just some resources as a takeaway um, from this keynote to be able to look. Um, most of the books that I show on there, especially my microservices books, are all free. So if you don't have a Safari Online account, still go to Developer to Architect. Look under books, and, and most of mine are, are downloadable for free. So anyways, um, I hope you enjoyed this opening keynote on architecture modularity and really kind of understanding what we're really trying to accomplish. Um, you know, the rest of the conference and tomorrow, we're going to actually see how to do these things. But again, now we have the context of why we're actually doing it. So thank you all so much. You've been an awesome audience. Thank you. All right. <laughs>